Thank you. It's uh, uh, my pleasure to uh, be here and speak at this workshop. Uh, this is my first time at IPM. I find this uh, place uh, very welcoming and uh, exciting. Um, this talk is based on, um, on a paper with the same title that uh, Pasha Pulyavsky and I uh, wrote. We, this is the beginning of a big project, as you will see. Um, and um, I must uh, confess that there will be no statistical mechanics in my talk and no discrete geometry. But maybe there will be some and in the team, <laughs> uh, which maybe connects uh, what um, I will talk about to uh, what you uh, are interested in. Um, I think it's uh, not unrelated. Um, so the, the subject of this talk is incidence geometry, more precisely linear incidence geometry. So this is a classical subject that goes back millennia. It's about configurations like the one that you see on the screen. So typically, we have a finite dimensional projective space, let's say, over the reals or over the complex numbers. And we have some lines or planes or subspaces of higher dimension in that um, projective space. And we know that some of them intersect in some unusual ways, like three lines pass through a point or two lines in the sp in three space uh, intersect, or four planes in three space uh, have a common point. And uh, you have a bunch of such conditions, and somehow, magically, uh, some other condition of the same sort follows. It's not common that we get to generalize a theorem that was first proof, proved in the year 340. This is Pappus' theorem. What it says, in case you forgot, is that if you have two lines in the plane and you picked any three points here, any three points there, and then you connected them in the way shown in the picture, then the three points in the middle lie on a line. This is a special case of Pascal's theorem. Do the outer line have to be parallel? No. No, there is no such thing as being parallel on the projective plane. So there are no conditions like that here. And another theorem that I'm going to generalize is Desargues' theorem, which is much more recent from 1639, what it says is that if you have two triangles which are perspective from a common point, so you know when you draw the line through respective vertices of the red and the blue triangle, these lines intersect at the same point, then the corresponding sides of these triangles intersect at points which lie on a line, the dotted line, the dashed line here. So our main result is a common generalization of these two theorems and many others. And the most surprising thing about it is that apparently it's new. Here is the simplest incidence theorem in three dimensions. Suppose you are given, it's due to Möbius. Suppose you are given six points in three dimensions. They don't have to be in convex position or anything, but just for the sake of notation, I'm going to think of them as being in the vertices of an octahedron. Not a regular octahedron, just some. And then I'm looking at triples of these points which correspond to the faces of the octahedron, including the back face which I get, corresponds to the outer region here. So there are eight such faces here. 
Four of them are pink, four of them are green. And Möbius theorem says that if the four pink planes intersect at a point, and remember, for four planes to intersect at a point, something magical needs to happen, right? Three planes, of course, would intersect at a point. But then the fourth one should pass through that one. So if, if the pink planes intersect at a point, then the green planes intersect at a point. Of course, all of these theorems implicitly rely on some genericity assumptions, like you know, we have these conditions satisfied, but otherwise everything is generic in the appropriate sense. So this uh, theorem is kind of occupies the same place as Desarg and Pappus occupy in, in two-dimensional linear incidence geometry. Of course, these are just uh, the simplest ones. There are many more. And one naturally wonders, is there some kind of general um, nomenclature of these theorems? Is, can we make sense of them all? Like, where are they coming from? And what other mathematics is this all related to? So that's what we're going, what I will attempt to answer in this talk. The golden age of projective geometry was the 19th century. And these are, here are some of the um, most prominent contributors to it during that time. Jean-Victor Poncelet, Michel Schall, Jakob Steiner, and Karl von Staudt. The very first sentence of the famous Erlangen program by Felix Klein says, reads, among the advances of the last 50 years in the field of geometry, the development of projective geometry occupies the first place. A few decades later, Hilbert said, uh, echoed the sentiment by saying that projective geometry has occupied a central position in geometric research and the theorems relating to incidence, by which he meant a more general class of theorems, not just the ones of the kind that I showed you earlier, are by far the most important theorems of projective geometry. So such was the sentiment in the 19th century. But then things changed. Here is a typical quotation from the 20th century. It's due to Paul Dirac a famous uh, physicist, projective geometry had its heyday, then gradually faded away. All the more elementary results were worked out, incorporated into textbooks. There wasn't any new work for mathematicians to do. Mind you, Dirac was a big fan of projective geometry. He really loved the subject. So this wasn't a denigrating statement. He was actually lamenting the demise of uh, the subject. And uh, a bit later, here is something from Buck McPherson and Mark McConnell. Well, you can read this, what, what they're saying. Notice the past tense here. Classical projective geometry was a beautiful <laughs> field of mathematics. It died, in our opinion, not because it ran out of theorems to prove, but because it lacked organizing principles by which to select theorems that were important. And also it was isolated from the rest of mathematics. I think this is very well put. It expresses the predominant sentiment of the time very well. To quote from Mark Twain, the announcement of the death of classical projective geometry in this case is a bit premature, as we will soon see. Um, the sentiment became even more pessimistic in light of Mnoff's universality discovery. So um, I'm not going to go into details uh, of, of the subject, but basically the result was that there is no hope 
to describe representability of matroids over the reals, which means that essentially, even in the case of a projective plane, there is no reasonable classification of incidence theorems. And so somehow, the whole subject seems hopeless. Peter Shore famously applied Minyov's results to show that representability over R is NP-hard. On the positive side, people created using Grebner basis techniques and similar computational commutative algebra technologies, software that could automatically prove for you any theorem that you would bring to them. Okay, so with, without using gray matter or, you know, without using brain assisted technologies. So any theorem like Pappus or Desarg or Möbius or whichever, you can enter into such a system and very quickly it will spit out a formal proof which will pass, you know, any kind of inspections. Of course, completely unilluminating proof, but it won't answer the main question, which is where this theorem came from to begin with. So again, these are the main questions. Where do these classical incidence theorems come from? Which of them are important and why? And what kind of other mathematics are they related to? So the way we attempt to answer these questions is by suggesting a putative master theorem of linear incidence geometry, which generalizes essentially all the known theorems. Like we went through textbooks from 19th century and early 20th century and uh, looked at every theorem that bared someone's name, uh, bore someone's name, and uh, lo and behold, each of them ended up being a special case of our master theorem. And as a result, we will obtain a unifying perspective on why these theorems hold, philosophically speaking. So this is a tall order, of course, so I'm going to <laughs> hopefully not disappoint you after this teaser. So the technology we are going to apply is tilings of oriented surfaces by quadrilateral tiles. So we, we work in topological categories. So this is not, these surfaces that don't have any geometries, they, they're just viewed as, you know, Riemann surfaces up to isotopy. And uh, then you, um, tile it by quadrilaterals, okay? Here are maybe more easier to digest examples. For example, here we see a torus, which actually has been uh, cut into quadrilaterals in two different ways. The yellow and red is one tiling, and the black lines give you another tiling. So I, I'm going to explain how e, each tiling of this sort, endowed with a bipartite labeling of its vertices, gives rise to an incidence theorem. In fact, to a string of incidence theorems, one in each dimension. So now let's uh, start in earnest. Uh, P will denote a finite dimensional projective space. I will work over R or C throughout. And by a tile, I will mean a topological quadrilateral whose vertices have been labeled by points, alternately by points and hyperplanes in our space P. So a hyperplane is a you know, point in the dual space. <clears throat> We call a tile coherent 
if first a genericity condition is satisfied, so contrary to what, what you would expect, we don't want this point A to lie on L. In fact, we want it not to lie on L. Okay, so we don't want any of these points to lie on any of these lines. And the important condition is that, you know, unless some coincidences hold, which generically won't happen, this is the important condition. The line that passes through these two points and the intersection of these two hyperplanes should intersect. So that intersection has co-dimension two. The line has dimension one. So when you have some two sub-varieties whose dimensions add up to something smaller than the dimension of the ambient space, they typically won't intersect, they will miss each other. And we want the, them to actually meet. That's the coherence condition. Let's illustrate what it means in the simplest case of a plane. On a plane, hyperplanes are just lines. The intersection of these two hyperplanes is just this point, and we want that point to have an intersection with the line AB. So this is just the condition that A, B, and L intersect M are collinear. So that's the coherence condition. Now, here is our theorem. Suppose we have a tiling of a closed-oriented surface. In this example, the surface is a torus. So this is a hexagon whose opposite sides are supposed to be glued to each other. Okay, so we start with a closed-oriented surface. It's, it's tiled by quadrilateral tiles. The vertices are colored black and white in bipartite fashion. Let's associate to each black vertex a point in our projective space. And let's associate to, a, to each white vertex a hyperplane. And let's impose this condition that these points don't lie on the hyperplanes. If all tiles with the exception of one are coherent, then the remaining tile is also coherent. That's the theorem. There is a good rule that you should, one should show at least one proof in a talk. And uh, in, this, in, in the case of this talk, it will be the proof of the main result, which is, doesn't happen often. <laughs> the key observation is that for each of such tile, we can introduce something called the mixed cross ratio. So these are points A, B. They are projectivization of some vectors, bold A and bold B. And these hyperplanes in the projective space are projectivizations of some covectors, bold L and bold M. And of course, vectors and covectors can be paired to give, to give um, scalars, and the mixed cross ratio is this expression. Now notice that if we rescale A by some constant, this expression is not gonna change. Similarly for B, for L, and for M. So th this is really a projective invariant, like the usual cross ratio. And the key observation, which is an easy exercise in elementary projective geometry, is that the coherence condition is equivalent to requiring that this mixed cross ratio is equal to one. Okay? Well, now we note that if we multiply all of these mixed cross ratios, then this will be a telescoping product. Each mixed cross ratio corresponds, each pairing corresponds to an edge in this graph, and it will be in the numerator on one side for, for, for the tile on the left and denominator for the tile on the right or vice versa. 
And so when you multiply these mixed cross ratios, you will just get one. Okay, so the product of all mixed cross ratios over all tiles is one. If all of, the, of them are equal to one with the exception of a single cross ratio, then the remaining cross ratio should also be equal to one. End of proof. Questions? Okay. Huh? I'm sure there is a dimer interpretation, yeah, for <laughs> practically everything, but <laughs> including, including this result. Yes, yes, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, all right, maybe you will tell me later what that is. Okay. What's much more interesting than the theorem itself is that actually, as I promised to you, Lots of famous results in linear incidence geometry turn out to be special cases of it. This is actually much harder to prove, to demonstrate, than the theorem itself, even though I call that the main result. But really, the main result is the observation that that simple theorem um, encompasses such a huge variety of, of uh, special cases. Let me show you how that happens. Let me start with Desarc's theorem. So this comes from the simplest possible tiling, the tiling of a sphere, which comes from the cube. OK, so here we have a cube. And as promised, I need to put a, a label at each vertex. The black vertices A, B, C, D correspond to the points A, B, C, D. And who are they? They are the vertices of the red triangle and the center of projection D. Okay, And we strategically place them. Well, I, I guess not so strategic because there is only one way to place them at, at, at those vertices. Up to isomorphism. OK. And then P, Q, and R are the sides of the blue triangle. OK. And now watch. For example, what does it mean that this face of the cube is coherent? It means that the line AC passes through the intersection of S and Q. OK, here is the line AC. This is S. Oh, no, this is the line AC. This is AC. This is S. This is Q. They intersect here. That point magically lies on the line AC. And you can check each of the six faces, and it will correspond to, uh, to a condition in this configuration. And of course, if one of them, them is missing, then it will follow from the rest, and that will be an, an equivalent restatement of Desarc's theorem. For example, we can define S to be the line that passes just through these two points, without requiring it to pass through that point, because we don't know it a priori. And then we can check all the conditions. And the only condition that we will uh, not be able to check is the fact that S intersects P at a point which lies on BC. Well, is there such a tile? Yes, this tile, the right one, BC and SP. OK, and that will follow from the other five conditions that we know are satisfied. OK, so this case was easy. Now let's move to Papus. You would think that in this case, just like before, we just need to pick some of the points and some of the lines of the original configuration and somehow figure out where to put them at the vertices of some tiling of some surface and then everything will work out. If that were the case, then my feeling is this ha would have been discovered long ago. But it's not that simple. We have to take, indeed, six of the nine points of the Pappas configuration. But then the remaining three points we need to replace by the three lines passing through them, like the three sides of the triangle, which is shown here in green. And then the corresponding conditions, the nine conditions of the Pappus theorem, will correspond to the nine tiles of this 
tiling of a torus. Like, for example, here, A, F, R, Q. What is that saying? The intersection of Q and R. Where is that? That's here at the top. Lies on the line A, F. Indeed, it does. And you check the, all these conditions. They exactly correspond to the conditions of the Pappus theorem. If eight of them are satisfied, then the ninth one follows by the master theorem. How do you choose the six points? So, well, I mean, we chose them as shown in the picture. When you say how, you mean there is no freedom of how place. did we uh, uh, discover this argument? Or, I mean, these are not, if I replace E, for example, by um, E and D by, let's say, this point and that point, I don't think it will be like uh, an isomorphic configuration. That's what you ask? Yeah, right. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? The torus is more complicated than sphere. Is it, does it mean that in some sense Pappus theorem is more complicated? Yes, and in fact, uh, this, is, this phenomenon is well known in incidence geometry. Uh, this arc theorem can be deduced from the Pappus theorem, but not the, well, the other way around. This is kind of a model theoretic statement, which, yeah. And, and in, indeed, in finite geometries, you can construct you know, non papian geometries, which will be desargesian, as they say. Wait, wait, was it hard to find this argument? It was hard in the sense that um, we had no idea that such a thing existed. If, if, if I just, uh, if I told you everything except for this proof and just told you, and now try to prove Pappus theorem, you know, maybe it will take you a few days, but you will find it. And anybody in this room, probably. But first, you need to come up with the whole suggestion. And second, perhaps even more importantly, you need to know that it actually works. It's like in, in an Olymp math Olympiad. You, you already know that this problem was solved. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't appear in, the com in competition, right? But that's exactly what we didn't know. So we actually didn't expect it to be the case. This, this came as a pleasant surprise. Initially, our expectation was that we will just be able to deduce some small subset of uh, incidence theorems and who knows you know, how big it's going to be. So, so is there any way to, like if you have a complicated surface like a torus, is there a way to like, collapse the surface to get a sphere? Like, is there, so you said the Pappus theorem can be deduced from this. Uh -huh. We discuss uh, the, uh, how that is done. It's done basically by gluing. You know, you can glue tori to get a sphere. I mean, you can decrease the genus by gluing surfaces, but you cannot increase gluing along disks and or things like that. So we, there is a discussion. It's, it, it would take too much time, but it, it's a bit technical. OK, the third uh, most famous theorem in planar incidence geometry is the complete quadrangle theorem, which you can imagine what it says just looking at the picture. Uh, <laughs> no, you cannot? OK. Take four red points, A1, A2, A3, A4. Draw the six lines through them. Four choose two. Look at where these lines intersect the black line. You will get six points. Then do the same with the blue points, B1, B2, B3, B4. Draw the six lines through pairs of them. And suppose that five of these lines will intersect the black line at exactly the same positions as the red lines did then the sixth line will do the same, okay? This is the proof. Again, <laughs> you would need to take these two slides, put them side by side, and check that the coherence of these tiles exactly co describes what is happening here. And now a commercial break, something that you waited for, I'm sure, so this is the, this is the styling, but now uh, sort of in flesh, right? This is, uh, 
this is an unpaid commercial for, a co for the company that makes these uh, magnetic toys, which, you know, this is these are magnets, but of course this is made of silicone, so, you know, isotopies are uh, readily available. Since we are in the break, this is another one. This is a piece, just a piece of a tiling. Notice how the vertices of the tiling are colored alternately in the bipartite fashion, right? So the makers of the toy thought about that as well. <laughs> now, uh, if you, of course, I cannot do it because my uh, uh, reality bending powers are limited, but you could, you know, like bend it and then try to stick it from the top. And that would not be good because the black, vert let me call these white and black, even though they're like pink and purple, right? This is pink and this is pink. So if you glue this to this, this to that, this to that, this to that, you would get a, a quadrangulation of a torus, but it will be such that it doesn't afford the bipartite coloring. Because locally, of course, there are no obstruction, but there is a macroscopic cycle in the fundamental group, which uh, sort of requires an odd number of edges to complete, right? But you can, of course, take these four things and twist them a little bit before bending it and sticking, and then it will give you a tiling as, uh, that satisfies all the requirements. End of commercial break. Now, uh, here is another theorem that called the permutation theorem. Again, what it says is you can glean from the screen. If all these conditions hold except for, let's say, these three lines are not known to intersect at a point, then they will intersect at a point. And this is a proof, another tiling of a torus. Of course, this is like cheating. I mean, you, it would take you quite a bit of time to you know, come up with a proof or even check it uh, after I uh, presented it to you. But since I'm doing it and you can get the slides from me later on, it's unlikely that I am lying to you, right? Because you will. Yes, question? What is the torus? Is it yeah, you glue opposite sides of the hexagon. So it, it's not only, everybody knows that if you take a rectangle and glue opposite sides, then you get a torus. But the same is true about the hexagon as well. So before you prove the theorem, do you know it should be torus or another? I space? wish I knew. Uh, excellent question. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't. Now. Question? Yes? Do you get instances where your uh, uh, tiles are more than four at a point? Yes. Yes, it, it's possible. Yeah, right. Can you compute the genus? Huh? Can you compute the genus ahead of time by the surface? Right, just from the number of incidences in that? No, because I don't know how many of these points and lines I will require. Uh, it will require. Sometimes I have to introduce like extra ones, as you could see. Like, there was no prediction. Even looking at the Pappas theorem, it's not clear, or, or Desarg, like, why it should be. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think it's possible to, to predict it uh, in this way. Um, this is a, an illustration of what can happen when you go the other way. You just decide, OK, why don't I take some tiling, which looks nice, and see which theorem comes out of it. Maybe it will be a new theorem that people haven't discovered before. This is one such new theorem. We call it twin stars of David. So if you squint a little, you, you will see there is a red star of David, and there is a blue star of David. And they are kind of mutually inscribed. And this pattern, again, has the property that if everything holds except for a single like intersection of these three lines at a point, 
then that intersection will follow. Yes? So, are you, is it possible that this is a, sort of a combination of the Zog theorems? It's possible, but we, it's not. Oh, the Zark? No. Because uh, I, I doubt it, because um, the corresponding surface uh, is not a sphere. And I believe that everything that you can get from Desarc sort of comes from a sphere. That's, that's the intuition. Yeah, I, I cannot prove it. Uh, in fact, that theorem comes from this tiling of the torus, so it's not terribly complicated. OK, let's go to 3D. So the Möbius theorem, remember, this technology works in any dimension. So instead of taking points and lines, we can take points and planes. And it turns out that if you take this particular tiling of the torus, which is kind of very simple, the dotted line means that you know, this is half of the tile, this is the other half, which you will glue it to. Right? This tiling of the torus by eight tiles provides you a proof of the Möbius theorem. This is um, the same tiling, but in 3D, of course, you don't see where the, tor the torus is sort of like, like so here in the, yeah, I don't know if you can. <laughs> um, after the talk, you can, uh, for, for a little uh, extra pay, you can <laughs> play with, the, with, with these uh, little gadgets and see. Uh, how it works, okay. There must be a joke around the fact that you don't need a Möbius strip to prove the Möbius theorem, but I couldn't come up with a, an elegant one. So, uh, here is a new one. There are many others, but this is a new one which we couldn't find in the literature. We call it the 13 lines theorem because it uses 13 lines. So you start with two lines. This is all in three space. You start with two lines, and then you pierce them by five vertical lines. I mean, they're not vertical. They're just, just pick some five points here, pick some five points there, and draw these lines, OK? So lots and lots of degrees of freedom. So it's kind of hard to expect that something Magical can happen when you allow so much freedom. Then you pick point P1 on the line M3. And then you draw the unique line that passes through P1 and pierces M1 and M4. So this line, you know, for every point and any pair of lines, there is a unique line passing through the point that pierces those two lines. So you draw that line and the point where it pierces M4 is going to be called P, P2. And then you construct P3 in a similar way by drawing a line through P2 that pierces the second vertical line and the fifth one, and then P4, then P5, then P6. And when you come return, lo and behold, you recover P1. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. This is an example of what in German is called the Schlissensatz. So it's a closure theorem. You, you go through steps, and then suddenly you come back to where you started. It's a Poncelet type phenomenon, uh, for those who know what that means. All right. So this is the proof. Comes from a genus 2 surface. In fact, that's how we discovered it, like the, the simplest non-trivial tiling. Because sometimes these tilings just give you a tautology, a result that really is not, um, you know, doesn't, is devoid of any substance. So uh, uh, this is a genus two kind of theorem. So what are some of the outstanding problems? Of course, the first one that is probably on everyone's mind is, is this truly universal? Can any theorem of linear incidence geometry be obtained as a special case of our master theorem? Um, it very much depends on what you mean by a special case. So many of these theorems are uh, that you can find in the literature 
they involve some highly degenerate configurations, like lots of lines pass through the same point, not just three. Or some line in the configuration has many more than three points. Okay? And uh, these results sometimes are special cases or degenerations of some more general theorems from, from which you know, they can be obtained either as limiting cases or as special cases. So when I'm saying that any theorem of linear incidence geometry is hopefully uh, a special case of our theorem, I mean special case that can potentially go through some degenerations like that. Problem two, is there an efficient algorithm for constructing a tiling that delivers a proof of a given theorem. By the way, such a tiling is not unique. There, it, it's possible that the same theorem can be proved using non-isomorphic tilings, or even tilings of surfaces of different genus. Now, you might, yes? This is not covered by the NP hard statement. Okay, that's my next uh, comment. Exa uh, excellent question. So, I'm not sure that's what you meant, but um, no. Uh, let me go back again. What, what did you ask? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, not you covered some in which? Hard, yeah. Should I repeat or? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned some statements about. Well, from what I understood, that finding these proofs can be NP hard. That's so, right. So this is exactly That's the problem. Too. Exactly, right. So, okay. Because when you said first, yeah, right. Okay, so there is no contradiction here because uh, no contradiction with Minoff universality because the difficulty of that NP hard problem may be entirely due to the difficulty of finding, uh, of, of sort of reverse engineering the tiling and perhaps even finding a resolution of singularities of sorts that is involved in uh, unspecializing a given incidence theorem. Because Minoff universality uh, applies to arbitrary matroids, which can be very, very degenerate. So uh, here we, we are dealing with sort of closed state, uh, statements, I mean, uh, belonging to a, to, a, to a closed algebraic variety. And uh, furthermore, it's possible that you are looking at a theorem, and in fact, this is not just theoretical. I did that myself a number of times. You're looking at a theorem. You know, you believe that it, it's coming from some tiling. But in order to construct that tiling, you need to first desingularize that theorem. You need to uh, sort of remove some unnecessary assumptions. But you don't even know what those assumptions were. Like you don't know, you don't know which more general theorem this one is is a projection of. And obviously, you know, finding such desingularizations it can be. It's easy to believe that this can be very hard. So, sort of making sense of the zoo of incidence theorems uh, can be difficult simply due to the difficulty of that stage. But um, a tiling provides you a certificate of validity, right? And there is no contradiction there, because a problem can be NP-hard, but it may, it may have like a polynomially um, a difficult certificate. Another natural question that comes to mind is, is this connection with genus. Like, what does the genus tell us about the, the theorem. Is there some kind of intrinsic property of a theorem, um, of an incidence theorem that is reflected in the genus of the surface? Yes? It wasn't clear to me why you need a surface and not a more general two-dimensional complex. Because these are like commuting, I mean. You can make a complex out of, out of squares, right? I could. Uh, that result in that but then, uh, then I would need some kind of algebraic 
um, condition that would correspond to the coherence of those tiles. And maybe, I mean, one can invent these kind of theorems, but I doubt this will expand the universe of you what we can. Just a collection of cycles and the graph of sum is zero and the surface is a nice way to represent. That's right. You need to cancel That's numerator right. and denominator. That's right, exactly. Any, basically, any time you have a, a cancellation, like a, a telescoping phenomenon, you can unwind, you can represent it as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a surface like that. Should your surface be oriented? Uh, yes, it should be oriented. It will automatically come out oriented. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I am actually uh, grossly uh, behind schedule, so let me maybe quickly run through the remaining slides. So, um, let me skip, actually, the next slide. So, this is about triangulations. So, in, instead of tilings by quadrilaterals, you can start with a triangulation then there is a way to transform a triangulation into a quadrangulation, basically like barycentric style subdivision, and then, uh, then there will be a way of getting Desarg and Pappus and many others through that. Okay, I'm skipping that. Now, another uh, change of perspective is that instead of taking a tiling into quadrilaterals, we can look at a multi-curve on the surface by this is basically a dual object. For each tile, we connect the opposite uh, midpoints, so to speak, of the, of the uh, sides of the quadrilateral, and then, then stitch them together to form closed curves on the surface. Okay? And this is, in fact, kind of a, a cryptomorphism, right? I mean, we can restate everything in the language of multi-curves. So Desarc's theorem comes from, from a cube, and uh, the dual configuration to the cube will be just three uh, generic uh, great circles in a sphere. And this is what you get for the Pappus and permutation theorems, for example, just uh, to show some nice pictures. Now remember, Desarc's theorem corresponds to the cube, which means that a flip in a tiling of this form corresponds to an application of the Zarks theorem. So the two incidence theorems that come from tilings which differ by such a flip, they are equivalent modular de Zarg. What does this correspond to in the language of multi-curves? Well, it just corresponds to a Yang-Baxter move or a braid move on a multi-curve. So applying Desarc's theorem just means dragging this red line through the crossing of blue and green. Okay. So now we have uh, local moves on nodal curves, so multi-curves. There is this Desarc flip, and then there are like simplification moves, which one can explain easily. They correspond to some trivial transformations of the theorem. And so it's natural to ask whether uh, if we start with some kind of uh, multi-curve and then try to reduce it down uh, using, you know, Desarc flips combined with these simplification steps, whether the reduced form will be unique modular Desarc. Yes? And your second move? Uh, yeah. I don't understand the consistency of the colors. Yeah, so it's not... It's inconsistent. So uh, the, the connectivity changes. And, and that's, um, it, it, it comes from taking two rectangles that are combined like this, and then I'm just removing this one. If this one is coherent and this one is coherent, then the ambient one is coherent. So this is equivalent to this one. And if you draw the lines, you know how they go. then you will see that that's the rule. So it's forced on us. I wish connectivity would 
get, yeah. So maybe I shouldn't have colored them. I should have rendered them both in black. That's, yeah, good. So, uh, okay, that was problem four. Now, I want to briefly mention another point of view, which is uh, based in, in the paradigm advocated by Babienka and Suris, uh, uh, the 3D consistency sort of uh, um, interpretation of, of uh, integrability. So suppose we have a point on a plane, and then we have three lines, and then we have three points. Then there is a unique line that you can place here so that, oh, sorry. Suppose we are given that these three tiles are coherent, OK? Then the Zark theorem can be restated as saying then that there, there is a unique line that you can place here at the top so that the three tiles that are uh, incident to, to the top vertex of the cube are all coherent. OK, so you have a cube. You put it on, on its head, so to speak. And the three bottom tiles are coherent. You want the three top tiles to be coherent. You, you choose the label at the top so that that condition is satisfied. There is a unique way to do that. Like there are more conditions you would think that can reasonably be satisfied, but the Zark tells you that's an optical illusion. So this gives us a dynamics we can propagate. And a theorem that we proved is that this dynamics exhibits 4D consistency. We wouldn't have even thought of asking this question if not for your book, because like, how would one even think about it in those terms? And this, indeed, this, is, this corresponds to some incidence theorems, which is shown on the next slide. <laughs> so this is not something that you would just kind of scratch your head and then scribble on a piece of paper, and, right? Uh, but of course, the magic is that at the end of this construction, we have these six lines which all go through this point. Isn't that amazing? You, so you start, of course, I didn't tell you exactly what. I mean, I told you, right? We, we, we start with this point, with any point, any four lines, and then pick six points so that these, the corresponding uh, uh, quadrilaterals are coherent. Then there is a unique collection of four lines which come from the Zark uh, that we already know. But more amazingly, there is a, exists a unique point that you can place here at the top, which makes all six tiles adjacent to it or incident to it uh, coherent. That corresponds to these six lines all passing through the same point. That's, pre that's pretty magical. Of course, there is no way one would think of this uh, if not for for you guys, yes. If you compare this with like Coxeter theorem, it looks very similar. Coxeter has so many theorems. Yeah. It's like <laughs> it's like saying I don't know, Eulerian numbers or <laughs> Cauchy <laughs> theorem. <laughs> <laughs> for example, yeah. there's one for circles. You start at a point, and you have lots of circles that intersect with lines and oh. circles. Maybe, maybe, but. This is all linear, so. There's a linear one, but I forgot how it works. Yeah, exactly, so. okay, maybe, yeah, maybe. It would be nice. Uh, What's the genus of the surface? Do you think of the oh, yeah, I, it's, yeah, we, it's, I don't remember, yeah. This is a case where it's not a surface, it's a union of faces of a cube. Right, that's right. I was, I was not. But, Incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> you were not incorrect. I agree. This is a different type of statement, and uh, but we believe that it can also be deduced, even though it is a different type of statement. It's about a certain surface, indeed, uh, embedded in like S three. But um, yeah, I mean, there uh, is a trick reducing it to Möbius theorem. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now. Uh, another integrability sort of, uh, another interpretation of Babienko Suris uh, for deconsistency consistency comes in the form of the Malochikov's tetrahedron equation. Suppose we have a configuration of points and lines, which is shown here. This is a zonotopal tiling of an octagon. 
And each of these guys, suppose, is uh, coherent. So these two points and these two lines satisfy the coherence condition. Then there is a unique way we can flip this hexagon, for example, and replace it by, by this, right? By desarc. So this will be a desarc flip. We get a new configuration, then another one, another one, another one, another one, by doing these eight flips. And at the end of the day, we will get the same configuration, but potentially there could be monodromy. We could re there is no a priori reason why we should return to the same labeling of the interior vertices by points and lines in the plane. And the magic is that the, uh, there is no monodromy. And this can be seen to be a restatement of the 4D consistency result. So to finish, uh, there are many other directions in which we can uh, move. Uh, these are some of them, like incidence theorems for circles and lines in the Möbius plane, or uh, looking at curves of high degree, which we currently pursue. Uh, theorems involving tangency conditions like Poncelet's closure phenomena. And then, of course, you can look at surfaces, uh, theorems of a field of finite characteristic, which we have one application of in our paper. Uh, there is a non-commutative version of this theory. We can look at in elliptic and hyperbolic geometry, and I'm sure many more contexts. So this is just the beginning of an exciting journey. That's it. Thank you.